I've been thinking a lot this week about um, our situation here in Sierra Vista. Not just uh, about Sierra Vista, but our worldwide church. We're in most of the nations of the world proclaiming the gospel. I was at Loma Linda a few weeks ago. I heard a lot of interesting things and uh, about our mission, about how it's going. I don't think that we have any just idea of how fast the work might be going in some places. Our mission is in our name. Seventh-day Adventist, does that mean something to you? Yeah. Sabbath keepers worship the Creator and Savior and look for His second coming and proclaiming it to the world. That's our mission. God has taken the weakest generation in the earth's history and given it to them, to us, a most precious responsibility of making him known to the nations. The weakest, the Bible says, will be like David. Something great is about to happen, don't you think so? The weakest is like David. Think of the weakest one here, me, maybe me, will be like David. And the strongest like the angels. And it will be said among them, what has God wrought? What has he done? To me, it's exciting to be a part of Christ's body, designed to carry the gospel to the world. A church with a mission <clears throat> and vision, like the first century church. Do you know the first century church carried the gospel to the world in one generation? By 64 AD, Paul could say the gospel has gone to every creature under heaven. What do you think? Do you think that our mission, living in the end of time, might bear some resemblance to Christ's mission when he came here? What motivated Christ's mission? I guess we could summarize by saying it was self-sacrificing, self-renouncing love. Self-renouncing love, unselfishness. Do you think that we are, as Christians, that we as Christians are but an extension of Christ's mission? You think so? Is that possible? Are we his arms, his feet, his mouthpiece to a dead and dying world who want meaning in their lives? I think that's the cry of every person that's living in the planet. What is my, what is my, what is my need? You know, what is the meaning of it all? I believe so. So what was Christ's mission statement like? You know what? It was very short and to the point. And I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 4, where his mission statement is found. It's very short. I've seen mission statements that were page long, as long as your arm. And people can't even read through it all, right? But the shorter a mission statement is, the more profound it is, the more effective it is. You can read it in just a few words. Luke chapter 4. And I want to read to you from verses 16 to 20. Luke chapter 4, 16 to 20. You all have it? Say amen. amen. Yes. It says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered to him the, prophet, the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. And now the mission statement. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he, anoint, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to, pre and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the message. That's the mission statement. He closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. Here Jesus is reading a messianic prophecy from the gospel prophet Isaiah, which he himself, Jesus, had inspired 700 years before, plus or minus, because he is the living word. It was a complete mission. 
He covers everything here, if you, if you think about it. We could have a whole study, maybe several on the first part alone. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's what Jesus said. That's how the work is done. Zechariah 4, 6 says, not by might nor by power, but by why what? My spirit, says the Lord. He was a, his was a spirit-filled mission. That's why his activities in life ignited such extremes. Can you see people on one hand, they were filled with rejection and denunciation, even, even uh, the death penalty. And on the other hand, there was outright acceptance. On the one side, what? Total rejection. On the other side, total acceptance. I don't see many fence setters as I read the, uh, the, first, uh, the, the first four Gospels, the four Gospels. Not many fence, first fence setters in the first century. They were either hot or cold. It was uh, a church of the first love, first century church. First love. Let's read a striking contrast in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Revelation 3, verse 15. You all know what that is, don't you? Laodicean message. It says, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold. Lukewarm stands for nothing. It just occupies and takes up space, right? I've been in that experience. Sometimes I've, I've noticed that about myself, just occupying space. Care of self. Let's look at God's army of people in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Joel chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. This looks like the opposite to me. If you've been studying Daniel, your Bible will turn open to Daniel. And then there's Hosea Joel. Pretty easy then. Joel chapter 2. I want to read about God's army. His last army. We know this is a last day passage because we'll read a few of the last verses in a little bit. Last day army that God has on the earth. Joel chapter 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord comes and it is near at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There has not ever been the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire, a fire devours, before, devours before them, and behind them a flame burns, and the land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, nothing shall escape them. It's like a cloud of locusts, right? In fact, locusts are a symbol of this. And you read about that in chapter 1 of Joel. The appearance of them is that the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap, like the flame of fire that devours the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their faces, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone according to his ways. They shall not break their ranks. They're happy with each other, right? They're all working in one accord. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when, the, and when they shall fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. This is God's, God's last army. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter at the win in, the, in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. He is strong and executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? I think the greatest day for the church is still ahead. What do you what think you? Okay. It gives me lots of hope when I read a passage like that. And the antidote for the Laodicean condition is found in Joel chapter 2. Again, verse 12 and 15 to 19. Let's look at this. 
Joel chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Therefore also now says the Lord, Turn you to me with all, even to me with all your heart, and with fasting and weeping and, and with mourning. And verse 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion. When did the trumpets blow in Israel? Heralding the Day of Atonement, right? <laughs> trumpet blew in Jerusalem. Over on a nearby hill, the trumpets blew again. And that person on another hill heard that trumpet and so forth. And the trumpets blew throughout the whole land. Calling people down to Jerusalem on the Day of Atonement. Does that ring a bell with you at all? <laughs> Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go for out of his closet and the bride out of her, the bridegroom out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and give not your heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore shall they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no longer make you a reproach among the heathen. We're living in the Day of Atonement, the great antitypical Day of Atonement. I believe the trumpets blow, and I believe I can hear them on a distant area, someplace. Soon they'll be heard all through the land. Have you been watching the news? I think I hear the sound of trumpet somewhere in the distance. Is, there, is this a last day idea? Indeed it is. In our Joel chapter 2, let's look at verses 30 to 32. Joel 2, 30 to 32. Pardon me? Joel 2, 30 to 32. Do you have it? Okay. Joel 2, 30 to 32. I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Then shall the sun be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And then we might look down a little bit further. Chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. I think we're approaching this time right now. Multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision, the, new, the, moon, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars, stars shall withdraw their shining, their shining. And the Lord shall roar out of Zion. Do you like that phrase? One of these days, that's going to happen. The Lord shall also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and earth shall shake, and the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of his people Israel. That's kind of how it ends up as far as life as we know it on this planet. There's another one, Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4. Let's look at that one. Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4. This is known uh, as the loud cry, the final revival on the, on the planet, the final true revival on the planet. Chapter 18, Revelation, verses 1 to 4. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was, what does it say? Lightened with his glory. The, the, the light is the character of God, and the earth will be lightened with an understanding of what God is really like. You know, that may be one of the best kept secrets in all the world right now. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations, how many, how many nations here? 
All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Where do you think the greatest number of God's people are today? In Babylon, right. And uh, as the earth is, is uh, literally deluged with light from heaven, people will see their place in, in God's plan and will come out of her, my people. That ye be not, not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. You know, there's a psalm that says, it is time for you, O Lord, to work because they have made void thy law. Notice what verse 5 says. For her sins have what? Reached unto heaven. And, she ha and God has remembered her iniquities. That's what lies ahead. I think it's wonderful. Something great is about to happen. The whole world will be lightened with the message of God's character. Our message to the world is the message of three angels. This morning I'd like to set the context for God's last day work of which we are all a part. The message of three angels is found in Revelation 14, 6 through 12. And we could add on verses 14 and 15 because this is the message that prepares the world for the second coming. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7 and onward. It says, <clears throat> we all know this pretty much by heart, I think, but I'd, I'd just like to remind us of it again because we have a message for the world, and this is our message. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having what? The everlasting gospel. That's where it starts. Everything after that is a, is a function of, of the everlasting gospel. To them that dwell upon the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, what kind of a voice? A loud voice. Everybody will hear this, by the way. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. That's actually a quote from the fourth commandment. Direct quote. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. Do you think that's important? That's the most stern warning in all the Bible of anything to happen on the planet. And uh, <clears throat> then, down just a few verses, 14 and 15, guess what? And he looked, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and one sat upon the cloud, one like the, to the Son of Man. This is one of the 200 references, over 200 references, to the second coming in the, in the, in the, in, uh, the book of Revelation. Or not in Revelation, in the book, in the New Testament, I should say. Over 200. This is one of them. So what do you think the first, the three angel messages are for? Preparing people for the second coming. That's what we're all about, right? Isn't that what we go door to door about, uh, Connie? Yeah, and David? One sat like the Son of Man, having in his head a golden crown, in his hand a what? Sharp sickle. That gives us an idea that it's harvest time. Jesus in the parable said, the harvest is what? The end of the world. Okay, that's when the end of the world as we know it, right? And verse 15, and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat upon the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, and the harvest of the earth is ripe. Wow. What a time in earth's history to be alive. Message of three angels. I want to kind of review a little bit of that with you. First of all, the everlasting gospel. That comes first. It's all about who? 
Jesus. Jesus is the gospel. Hanging on the cross, Christ is the gospel. And all the grace that flows from heaven comes as a result of that. Fear God. Re re reverence him. Obey him. Love him. Keep his commandments. That's how we fear God. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And then righteousness by faith is here. Have you ever heard of that before? That came to this people a number of years ago, and it should be the cornerstone of everything we teach. Righteousness by faith. Give God the glory because there's no merit in any of the best things that we do. Is that right? And then the reality of the pre-advent judgment. God is going to judge before he comes. Doesn't that make sense? God's end time seal, the Sabbath, written in the forehead. The second coming. All this and much, much more is the message. These are the great pillars of Bible truth. Without them, we would have no chart or compass, and we would have no message for the world that would be biblical. It would be a terrible thing to run out, get all out of breath, and then get there and not have a message, right? <laughs> that happened in the Old Testament with David and one of the runners, right? Absalom was uh, in his mind, and his son. He wanted to hear what was happening to his son. Even though his son was against him, he was, still loved his son, right? The runner came. He saw the dust in the distance. The runner got there, and he was all out of breath, and he didn't have any message. What do you think David thought about that? Wow. Without any of these pillars, we would... We could be deceived by false prophets who are going to and fro in the world today. They're all over the place. They're as plentiful as the frogs of Egypt, literally. Point number one, the everlasting gospel. That takes us back into the Old Testament. First seven chapters of Genesis. Are they important? First seven chapters of Genesis tells about the sin problem, where it all came from, where we came from. And the need of a Savior and the first promise of the Savior coming there. And then the great flood of Noah. Without those ideas, we would have a pretty hard time carrying our message to the world. And then the sanctuary in the Old Testament. And sin and blood and cleansing and salvation and love. And then fear God. He is real, and he is there. And that he comes to God must believe that he what? That he is. And that he is, he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. He's our God, our defense, our strong tower, in whom we can run into when we are in a time of trouble. Do you ever have that time? Yeah, I like to come to him once in a while for shelter, right? Once in a while, it's about every, every day, all day long. Fear God, the angel cries. When you are in his presence, nothing else matters. He is our Lord. And we are in awe of him. And we reverence him. And if we truly fear him, we will obey him and love him and cherish him every day of our lives. Here in this chapel, we meet with God. How we conduct ourselves in this room is an, either an act of fear God or ignore him. Did you hear me? How we, how we are in this little chapel is either an act of fear God, reverence him, right? Or ignore him. I was so happy today, I heard music here playing and singing during our, dinner, during our time between the two services, between Sabbath school and church. Isn't that neat? That sets the stage for our worship. I'd like to suggest that we spend some time thinking about how we can have a more reverent atmosphere in the presence of the God that we worship. Amen. Give glory to God, the angels in, in Isaiah 6. I want to kind of close with this thought because my time is up. I'm going to finish this sermon in a couple of weeks when I'm here. But I want to end this sermon with uh, Isaiah chapter 6. 
Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Isaiah comes into the presence and vision of our holy God. Isaiah chapter 6. Verses 1 to 4. It's about halfway through the Bible. <clears throat> sometimes when I'm in a Bible study and sometimes new people have a little time, trouble finding some of the books, the Bible, right? I used to be that way. And uh, it's a good idea in a, in a Bible study like that, if you're in that situation, look and see where the Bible, how much of the Bible is, is uh, you know, where it is. In the middle of the Bible or is it early in the Bible or where? Isaiah 6 verses 1 to 4. In the year of King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And it, and it stood, above it stood the seraphims. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. You know, these seraphim, six, an order of angels with six wings, okay? <laughs> I want to see those angels someday, don't you? They hover around the throne. They're in the presence of God. And even being in the presence of God all the time, they still believe he's holy. That's all they can say. They're in such awe of him. They are aware of no righteous accomplishments of their own, but only God. That is the innocence that we lost at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Everything turned inward after that point. Giving God glory is objective. It's outward looking. It's not inward looking. We sit in, the pre in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, it says in Ephesians 5, 6 verse 2. We I'm sorry, 2 verse 6. We sit with him in heavenly places. We can have that privilege now. All this must have been fearsome to the prophet to behold as he sees the angels in God's presence crying, holy, holy, holy. And poor old Isaiah's response is the response of every true believer who truly sees the Lord. Isaiah 64. Isaiah 6, verse 5. Then said I, woe is me. For I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the Lord. What an idea. Do you spend some time every day seeing the Lord? Where's the best place to find him? In the, in the Holy Bible, right? This is a Jesus book. We learn to know him and his father and Hester the Holy Spirit also, right? <laughs> the Godhead. We learn to know God dearly as we spend some time every day in his word. You know, that same prophet in Isaiah 64, 6 says, said that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That was the holy prophet that said that. What about me? <laughs> I'm certainly not any better than that, right? That's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. It calls forth our deepest praise. The song says, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling, right? Give glory to God. He's the one who creates and saves. This idea of give glory to God is nothing short of righteousness by faith, which is so powerfully given to this people many years ago. And with that, I want to, uh, to say this. Give your heart to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. And then spend some time every day in the Word. Learn to know Jesus. Why do we study the Word anyway? So then faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And salvation is by what? Grace through faith, right? That's why we spend time. The other reason we spend time reading the word is to know Jesus. That's how we get to know him. Spend some time every day in the word. How long should you spend every day? 
reading the word. Maybe at least as much time as, you know, there's a text in Jeremiah 15, 16 says, thy word was found and I did eat them and they were unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. So how long do you think we should spend time eating God's word? As, at least as much time as we sit at the table eating physical food, right? Till we're fed, till we're fed. Good, that's a good one. Okay, this morning I want to extend an invitation to everybody that's here. There may be somebody here that has not given your heart to God in a meaningful way. I'd like to make this appeal. Please make your calling and election sure. We're living in serious times. I can hear the footsteps of the king already. Can you? Don't put it off. Spend some time with God every day. If there's someone here who has never given your heart to Jesus in a meaningful way, I want to pray for you this morning right after the, after the hymn. Maybe somebody would like to be baptized into the Lord. If there's somebody like that that's desiring baptism, please let us know. I want to open the doors of the church today. Maybe there are people who have been meeting here with us who have come from other places and haven't changed your church membership. I'd like to invite you to be a part of this body of believers and to be a part of all this. And for all of us, let us build solid. Shall we pray? Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for being with us. Thank you for allowing us to even worship you and to be alive to do that. Thank you for life and health and strength. Father, I want to pray for anyone here this morning who is discouraged or who needs to find you. I pray, Lord, that you will make yourself so readily apparent to them that they can't refuse. Please be with each one in that situation, Lord, and be with all of us according to our several needs this morning. I pray, Lord, that you will help us, Lord, to see how much you really love us and how much you really care for us so that we will have strong faith in you. Put it in our hearts, Lord, to spend some time with you every day so that we can know you better and so that we can trust you and have faith in the grace that you've provided for us. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.